A Tale of Two Compositions, Chapter One, New York, The Meandering Path. The composer was visiting the city for a few days for a performance. The performance, unfortunately, hadn't been that great, so the composer conveniently decided to forget about it. It was the following evening, around 11 p.m., after another concert on the Upper East Side, and the composer walked to the subway. It was a quiet and lovely spring evening. The wind was gently blowing, and that made an awning squeak. It was an interesting rhythmic squeak. The composer stopped in the street to listen and thought, wow, that would make an interesting violin piece, and filed it into the brain's database under remember this idea for a future piece. Years later, in another city on the other side of the country, the composer ran across Albert Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. The composer laughed and remembered the squeaking awning. This kind of repetition could support Einstein's definition of insanity, or this kind of repetition could be seen as a mantra that is repeated over and over for meditative purposes to her, perhaps strive for enlightenment. And so the question the composer hypothetically posed was, would listening to the squeaking awning be enlightenment or insanity? <laughs> and hence, the piece's title became Or. Sitting down to write the music, the composer translated Albert Einstein's name into musical pitches. <laughs> From this collection, the composer selected two, and those two became the half-step squeak. But having just a squeak ad infinitum didn't really seem enough of a piece, so the composer decided to have a chord break up the repeating squeaking. But it would always be the same chord, just different locations for the individual notes. Using the other pitches of Einstein's name, the composer figured out a quadruple stop or a four-note chord and ran it by a performer, asking them to strum it like a guitar to add a little bit of variety to the squeaking that had been played with the bow. The performer said it worked, but it was a little awkward. So they suggested another voice sing for the pitches, making one note an octave higher and the other an octave lower, and it became something that was much more comfortable to play. While running through the different voicings, instead of strumming the notes, at one point the player just tried playing all of them together. And the composer liked the sound of that much better on the cello versus sort of the strummed chords that were, have been practiced and changed that in the piece. The squeaking followed by this two chord cadence became a phrase and the basic idea for the piece. The composer remembered the rule of thumb in counterpoint, that a sequence should happen three times for maximum impact. And so, this phrase would be repeated in its entirety three times. The fourth time, it would start but never reach the cadence and quietly fade away. That left the length of the piece to be determined. To be truly meditative, something in the range of 20 or more minutes is usually good. However, in a concert set setting, with one squeaking sound for 20 minutes, felt a little too daring. So the composer chose the four or five minute mark to contain the squeaking that would hopefully be enough to ponder the question of enlightenment or insanity. Often, there's a discrepancy between theory and practice. And although the composer loved the theory of the piece yet, wasn't quite convinced that it would translate orally. So, two things happened in quick succession. First, a PDF of the score was emailed to a friend, another composer, along with the question, do you think this is a stupid idea? 
They emailed back and said no, but had a suggestion. Since the squeak was on the third string, and the fourth open string was right there, why not add that in as well to add some more harmonic interest to that half-step squeak? The composer was very happy with the brilliant suggestion and thus dedicated the piece to that friend, Jeffrey Holmes. Second, to check the practicality of the work with the performer, the piece was then emailed to a violinist asking the question, do you think this is a stupid idea? Sakura Tsai played through the piece and said, no, it's not a stupid idea, and informed the composer that she would be playing it on the What's Next concert the following month. At the concert, there were no program notes, and the composer was concerned about the audience understanding the meaning of the title, or not wanting the audience to think uh, about it as iron or gold ore, the composer asked the organizer if someone could read the program notes beforehand. He wasn't crazy about that idea, but suggested that the performer say not just the title at the end of the piece, but surround it with enlightenment and insanity.
after the performance, it was interesting for the composer to hear if listening, listeners had had feelings of either extreme. Chapter two, Los Angeles, recipe for a new double bass piece. Step number one, musician calls composer. Bass player asks composer to write a solo piece. Bass player asks composer to write a solo piece, potentially with a video or film component. Bass player reveals that the performance is in two months. Bass player politely reminds the composer that he'll also need time to practice and learn the as yet unwritten piece with the as yet unknown theoretical film. <laughs> Step number two, composer calls filmmaker. Composer thinks that using an existing film would be the easiest, so composer asks Nana Chuchua, the artist and filmmaker, if she has any films that she wouldn't mind having some new music for. The video artist gives composer a DVD of several films and thankfully says, pick whichever one you want. <laughs> Composer's selection is mostly based on length and the selection process is, is much like that of oatmeal. Not too hot, not too cold, but something just right. The composer selects one about eight minutes long, which is just right and a good length for a solo piece. It's called Mouvement Cloisonné that has a rockin' soundtrack and some really cool images. In addition to being a wonderful artist and filmmaker, Nana Chichua also runs the Tula Tea Room at the Museum of Jurassic Technology. And she has a samovar there with tea that she imports from her homeland, Georgia, the country, not the state. Step number three, composer consults a dictionary. Composer has uh, Robert and Collins' bilingue nouvelle édition dictionnaire, a French-English dictionary, and looks up cloisonné. It's a verb meaning to divide, to partition, to compartmentalize. It's basically about restricting or containing something. Step number four. Composer watches the film with the sound turned off. The film shows many contained or precise movements. There is a clock mechanism moving back and forth quickly. There is a man writing in the book. This man is the uncle of the filmmaker. He looks like a friendly Rasputin. There is dancing by the National Georgian Ballet, the country, not the state. There is a brooch being made, specifically the detailed work of constructing delicate jewelry called cloisonné that is a technique of forming small metal compartments and filling these different compartments with different kinds of enamel and inlay. Step number five, composer tries to relate the music to the film. Since the opening movement is that of a watch mechanism and it's very rhythmically consistent, the composer decides to have a regular or constant beat throughout the piece. The composer also thinks of the four open strings that are on an instrument. To contain the music, the composer has the performer always having one open string in a rhythmic and constant back and forth motion. Thus, that open string creates a ceiling or boundary. The composer also thinks about repetitive ideas in that if there's nothing to contrast or compare it to or it doesn't change, there's no overall motion or interest starts to wane because the brain's not getting any new information. The composer then decides to have the music move from medium high through medium down to a low register and then back, ending the whole piece in a very, very high register. Step number six. Composer thinks of the concepts of sorbet and retuning. In the midst of all the activity, the composer decides that there needs to be a moment to cleanse the palate, so to speak. When the movement hits the bottom of the instrument's range, 
The consistent back and forth motion stops and some other things are added. You'll hear harmonics and some pizzicato. The composer thinks about the usual tuning of the four strings of the instrument and decides to add variety to the usual tunings and changes two of the strings. At this point, the composer accesses the brain's database under the remember this idea for a future piece and thinks about what someone once mentioned regarding the psychological effect for a listener when there is a tuning, detuning or retuning of a string. There is something about the tension or release created by moving towards or away from a note that was interesting at the moment that it is presented. Since it takes time and a physical movement with one hand to retune and basically it disrupts the whole piece and the music, the composer decided to write the tuning into the piece. So while the pizzicato bit is happening, the string gets retuned. And this plucking and retuning leads to the finale of the piece when the performer ventures to the high end of the instrument's register and the work finishes converging to a single repeated note that then cadences into two long-held notes. Coincidentally, the notes do the opposite to the upward half-step tuning that just happened and the first note resolves down a half-step into the second. <laughs> Step number seven, composer compiles the final product. The musician records the music, and along with the film, all are sent to Disc Makers Manufacturing Center in Pensauken Township in New Jersey, the state, not the country. And voila, there is a new solo bass piece with a film component.